I think it is clear to believe in the power of ideas. Fresh, thank you for the Manhattan Institute. Long before September 11th, 2001, our next speaker was actually very busy doing what we are going to spend the rest of the afternoon talking about, searching for and striking a proper balance between our national security and our civil liberties. In 1995, as a judge on the U.S. District Court of the Southern District of New York, Michael Mukasey presided over the trial of 10 Islamic militants for plotting to blow up the United Nations and other landmarks around the city. He handed down life sentences in that case to the so-called blind sheik Omar Abdul Rahman and El Sayed Nosar, whose legal defense was allegedly paid for by Osama bin Laden himself. After the 9-11 attacks, Judge Mukasey presided at the trial of Hussein al a former roommate of Zakarias Musawi, thought to have been the missing 20th hijacker of the 9-11 plot. Because of his role in this and other cases, such as Padilla versus Rumsfeld, Judge Mukasey has long been targeted by Al-Qaeda. The threat to his safety was deemed so great that it required round-the-clock protection of the United States Marshal Service. In an article assessing Judge Mukasey's judicial legacy on the occasion of his retirement from the federal bench in 2006, the late lamented New York Sun quoted a friend of his, defense lawyer Charles Stillman, who remembered seeing the judge walking on Park Avenue to a synagogue on a Saturday morning in 2003. Stillman said, and I quote, I made a beeline toward my friend to say hello, and suddenly two huge marshals step up. The sacrifice he made for his country was to give up his privacy and give up his peace. We owe him for that. There are few people in the country who have done as much as Judge Mukasey to uphold our laws, to protect our liberties, and to keep us safe. Ladies and gentlemen, the 81st Attorney General of the United States, Judge Michael Mukasey. Thank you, Larry, for that. It says here, generous, it should be lavish introduction. Um, and also to the Manhattan Institute for organizing this program, and Judith Miller for inviting me to participate in it. Uh, thanks also to you for being here, obviously. Um, the enormity of what was done to us on September 11, 2001 uh, deserves all the solemnity and scholarship that's being used to mark the 10th anniversary this week. But I think that serious distortions can result uh, from treating 9-11 as a transformative event if doing so suggests that that was Islamism's first confrontation with the United States or that the country's reaction to what happened that day somehow changed in some fundamental way and irrevocably uh, the way our government deals with our adversaries. I think neither is true, uh, and I think also that it's useful to understand that in order to understand how it is that the country that dealt so successfully uh, with the two isms that haunted the 20th century, fascism and communism, uh, has had such mixed success dealing with Islamism, uh, which seems to be the ism of the current century. Actually, as a matter of history, Islamism, insofar as it holds this country in a weird combination of awe and contempt, uh, has been incubating for about as long as we have known about the other two isms that we successfully confronted in the last century. As a movement uh, distinct from the religion of Islam itself, uh, Islamism traces back to Egypt in the 1920s, when the loosely organized Muslim Brotherhood was established by a man named Hassan al-Banna, uh, a primary school teacher. Albana founded the Muslim Brotherhood as a reaction to the modernizing influence of Kemal Ataturk, who had dismantled the, shelf, the, the, the shell, I should say, of what was left of the Muslim Caliphate in Turkey, uh, banned fezes and headscarves, and dragged his country uh, by the lapels, and they had to be lapels because he couldn't wear robes, uh, into the 20th century. Albana's principal disciple was also an educator, uh, a bureaucrat in the education department of the Egyptian government named Said Kutub. Um, who caused enough trouble in Egypt uh, to get himself a traveling fellowship in 1948, uh, the year al was killed in violence that had been generated by the Muslim Brotherhood. 
that fellowship was intended to have the benign effect of getting him out of the country, and it did have that effect, but regrettably for us, he, tro he chose to travel to the United States, and in particular to Greeley, Colorado. Now, I think it would probably be hard to imagine uh, a more inoffensive place than post-World War II Greeley, Colorado, uh, but for a man like Saeed Qutb, it was Sodom and Gomorrah. He hated everything he saw, uh, American haircuts, enthusiasm for sports, jazz, what he called the animal-like mixing of the sexes, even in church. Uh, his conclusion was that Americans were, as he put it, numb to faith in art, faith in religion, faith in spiritual values altogether, and that Muslims must regard, as he put it, the white man, whether European or American, as our first enemy. He said Muslims must make this the cornerstone of our foreign policy and national education. He went back to Egypt, quit the civil service, joined Hassan al-Banna's Muslim Brotherhood. Qutb and the Muslim Brotherhood continued to agitate for a return to fundamentalist Islam. They welcomed uh, Nasser's coup against the corrupt monarchy in 1952, but then became disillusioned, became disillusioned with him when he failed to institute Sharia law or even to ban alcohol. Qutb opposed Nasser, was arrested, tortured. However, he continued to write and agitate for Islam and against Western civilization, particularly against Jews, who he blamed for atheistic materialism and said to, were to be considered the worst enemies of Muslims. He was released for a time, but eventually was rearrested, tried for conspiracy against the government, and hanged in 1966. Many members of the Brotherhood fled to Saudi Arabia, where they found refuge in ideological sustenance. Qutb's brother was among those who fled and taught the, doc taught the doctrine in Saudi Arabia. Among his students were Ayman al-Zawari, an Egyptian who would become a leading al-Qaeda ideologist, and a then obscure Osama bin Laden, the pampered child of one of the richest construction families in the country. Uh, and the rest, as they say, is history. That history did not come to these shores on September 11, 2001, or even on February 26, 1993 when a truck bomb went off in the basement of the World Trade Center, killing six people, wounding hundreds, and causing millions of dollars in damage uh, in what would eventually become known as the first World Trade Center bombing. Rather, it came at the latest uh, in the 1980s, when a couple of FBI agents spotted a group of men taking what looked like particularly aggressive target practice at a shooting range in Calvert and Long Island. When they approached, uh, they were accused of what we now call racial profiling, and backed off. Uh, in November 1990, one of those men, El Saeed Nosser, would assassinate a right-wing Israeli politician named Meyer Kahana in the ballroom of a Manhattan hotel not far from here. The case was treated by the Manhattan DA as the lone act of a lone gunman. When the 1993 World Trade Center bombers demanded freeing Nosser from jail, it became apparent that the Kahana assassination was not the lone act of a lone gunman. In fact, when authorities reviewed the amateur video of Kahana's speech the night that he was killed, they discovered that one of those 1993 bombers had been in the hall when Kahana was shot. Um, and that further investigation disclosed that another was driving what was supposed to be Nosaire's getaway vehicle. The man who served as the spiritual advisor to Nosaire um, and to the 1993 Trade Center bombers and who issued from jail the fatwa to carry out the 2001 World Trade Center attack, Omar Abdul Rahman, the so-called blind sheikh, along with Nosair and several others, were tried before me and convicted of participating in a conspiracy to conduct a war of urban terror against this country. That included the Kahana murder, the first Trade Center bombing, uh, and a plot to blow up other landmarks around New York uh, to assassinate Hosni Mubarak when he visited the United Nations. The list of unindicted co-conspirators in that case included Osama bin Laden, the pampered rich kid who had studied at the knee of Syed Qutb's brother in Saudi Arabia. All of this was treated as a series of crimes, unconventional crimes maybe, but merely crimes. In 1996, and again in 1998, Osama bin Laden declared that he and his cohorts were at war with the United States, a declaration that got very little serious attention. In 1998, our embassies in Nairobi, Kenya, and Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, were almost simultaneously bombed. And again, the criminal law was invoked with the usual mantra of bring them to justice. This time, an indictment that named bin Laden as a defendant actually was filed in the Southern District of New York. 
Apparently, he was unimpressed, or at least undeterred, because in 2000, his group, Al-Qaeda, bombed the USS Cole in Aden, Yemen, killing 16 US sailors, and would have carried out the bombing of another naval vessel, the USS the Sullivans, but for the fact that the barge carrying the explosives was overloaded and sank. And then, of course, came September 11, 2001. And to the call, bring them to justice, was added the call, bring justice to them. And we were told that we were at war, which was more than 50 years after Syed could have determined that Islamists would have to make war on us, about 15 years after Islamists had made it, had made it clear that they were training for a war with us, and five years after Osama bin Laden made it official with a declaration of war. Apart from military action in Afghanistan, uh, the administration sponsored and Congress passed the often derided but rarely read USA Patriot Act, which is simply a series of provisions that applied to terrorism cases, measures that were already in place with respect to other kinds of crimes, including roving cell phone wiretaps that had been used for years in narcotics investigations, and authorized the gathering for intelligence purposes of documents and records that could already be gathered in criminal investigations by any young government lawyer with the simple and unsupervised expedient of a grand jury subpoena. It also helped break down the wall of separation between intelligence gathering and law enforcement that had prevented law enforcement and the intelligence community from sharing information, a wall believed to be based on a statute that turned out to have been misread. The administration also responded with at least the beginning of a recognition that we were facing not simply a law enforcement problem, but in fact a war. The means to fight that war had to be suited to the enemy who confronted us. Islamists did not occupy a country that could be conquered and subdued, or indeed any particular territory. The main weapon to defeat them was and is intelligence. The, as I should extrapolate here, as Commissioner Kelly made clear, as I understand it this morning. The Bush administration undertook two programs that became topics of controversy. One was an electronic intelligence gathering program that targeted the communications of foreign terrorist organizations and their adherents, at first outside and then within the terms of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. That program has been authorized and reauthorized by Congress and remains in force to this day. It is one of the main reasons why terrorists have had at best limited success in mounting attacks in this country in the decade since 9-11. The second was an interrogation program run by the CIA and since abandoned amid claims, which are demonstrably untrue, that it involved the use of torture. That program yielded enormously valuable information, even though of the thousands of terrorists captured by the United States, by United States forces, fewer than a thousand were detained by the CIA. Of those, fewer than a third was subjected to any harsh interrogation technique, and of those, three, Abu Zubaydah, who gave up, uh, gave up information leading to the capture of Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, known as KSM, KSM himself, the mastermind of the 9-11 plot, and Abdel Rahim al-Nashiri, who organized the attack on the USS Cole, were ever subjected to the, harsh, to the harshest of those techniques, waterboarding. In fact, it's been pointed out that when you consider the number of journalists who claimed that they subjected themselves to waterboarding and pronounced it to be torture, it seems apparent that more journalists have been waterboarded than terrorists. <laughs> As is apparent from the detailed mo memos uh, that were improvidently released by the Justice Department, which disclosed those techniques, in, those techniques in detail, none of them violated the torture statute. The CIA program, as I said, has been scrapped, and we have told the world, including our adversaries, that the limit of what is permitted to anyone acting under the authority of the United States, from the most carefully trained and supervised CIA employee on the most urgent intelligence gathering mission, to the rawest recruit in the armed forces confronting someone captured in battle, the limit is the Army Field Manual, which is designed for the rawest recruit, has been available on the internet for years, and has been used by terrorists for years as a training manual. As I said at the beginning, our success has been mixed. Osama bin Laden is assuredly dead. We have had in, to in, in 10 years no repetition of an attack on the scale of 9-11, although the now abandoned CIA interrogation program disclosed that there were follow-up attacks planned, including on the Library Tower in Los Angeles, the Canary Wharf complex in England, attacks that were thwarted because we were able to find out about them and stop them. 
We have, however, had attempts and some successes. Omar Farouk Abdul Muttalib, trained by Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, tried to de detonate a bomb aboard an airplane over Detroit in December of 2009 and failed only due to the bravery of the crew and fellow passengers. In May of 2010, Faisal Shahzad, supported by the Pakistani Taliban, tried unsuccessfully to detonate a car bomb in Times Square. One terrorist actually murdered an army recruiter in Little Rock, Arkansas. Another, an army major, murdered 13 of his fellow soldiers at Fort Hood in November 2009. And of course, after 10 years, during most of which we have had in custody, the planners of 9-11, we appear to be nowhere near trying them. We are also completely wound around the axle when it comes to answering basic questions. Questions like, who is our adversary? What do we do with the people we capture? Are we in a war? And if so, must we know from the beginning what victory will look like or else refuse to fight? How come we're there? I would suggest that a clue to how come can be found in the response of our government to September 11 itself and its anniversary, and its response to the near misses and hits that I mentioned a moment ago. Lest anyone think that I think the administration that I served in is blameless in all regards, uh, recall that the President told us within days of the attack that Islam is a religion of peace and that it had been hijacked by extremists. Imagine, if you will, President Roosevelt telling a joint session of Congress on December 8, 1941, that the peaceful Shinto religion had been kidnapped by extremists. Fast forward to last week when the White House issued talking points about the 9-11 anniversary, urging that those inclined to repeat them suggested their listeners that 9-11 wasn't simply an American experience, that, quote, citizens of, of over 90 countries perished in the 9-11 attacks, unquote, and that, quote, we honor all victims of terrorism in every nation around the world. We honor and celebrate the resilience of individuals, families, and communities on every continent. There followed a list of eight cities around the world, including Belfast, which, as far as I know, hasn't had a terrorist attack since 9-11 and certainly hasn't had any related to Islamist terrorism. But oddly, not one of those cities was located in the one country that has confronted terrorism from the very day of its existence. Although Umar Farouk Abdul Muttalib was sent here by foreign terrorists to blow up an airliner on Christmas Day, and although his principal value at the time of his capture was as a source of intelligence, and it would have been useful to find out who sent him, something that must have been sensed at the time, but was confirmed later when we found that package bombs that were of the same type as he was carrying started appearing in packages headed for this country. Nonetheless, he was treated as an ordinary criminal defendant and read his Miranda rights. At the time of the near miss in Times Square, before we knew who had planted the bomb or why, the mayor of this fair city offered to bet the princely sum of a quarter on the proposition that whoever had done it was angry about the health care legislation. He too was treated, that is Faisal Shahzad was treated as an ordinary criminal rather than interrogated as, as a potential intelligence source. And after Major Hassan's murder of 13 of his fellow soldiers at Fort Hood, preceded by a history of expressions of Islam-inspired opposition to the United States, and of course the cry of Allahu Akbar before he started shooting, the Army Chief of Staff said afterwards that the principal tragedy he was concerned with was injury to the Army's diversity program. And the official report about the incident nowhere mentions Islam or Islamism as Major Hassan's motivation. Finally, in August, the White House issued a paper styled Empowering Local Partners to Prevent Violent Extremism in the United States. It runs to eight pages, and it tells us that the principal challenge we face in rema uh, is remaining united and avoiding anti-Muslim backlash as ideological motivated followers of Al-Qaeda, and we aren't told what the ideology is, just that they're ideologically motivated, try to radicalize members of the Muslim community. Why they would do that, we have no idea. The way we do this, according to this paper, is through community-based initiatives and grassroots partnerships with what is referred to as local stakeholders in the affected community. Small wonder that such stakeholders, as the Council on American-Islamic Relations, CARE, which is affiliated with Hamas and the Muslim Brotherhood and was named as an unindicted co-conspirator in the leading terrorism financing case in this country, and others similarly minded, have announced that they support this paper for a wide variety of reasons, 
whether because of our experience with the treatment of people of Japanese ancestry in this country during World War II, or because we have a reluctance that is in many senses of the word constitutionally based, it's in our constitution as written and the constitution we have inside of us, uh, are reluctant to talk about other people's religions. For whatever reason, there has been a prevailing refusal to identify and understand what motivates our adversaries. As to the question of what we do with the terrorists we capture, according to test congressional testimony by General William McRaven, head of Special Operations Command, we have no coherent policy on what to do with the people we capture. The administration refuses to send anyone to Guantanamo, although it is in fact a state-of-the-art facility. I have visited it and had occasion when I was a judge to visit various U.S. prisons, and it compares favorably with medium security facilities in the federal system. So we can either bring them to this country for trial in an Article III court with the perverse effect of rewarding people who refuse to follow any of the rules of war with better treatment than they would be entitled to as prisoners of war. The alternative to that, he testified, is turning them over to another country, at which point we lose control over any information they provide, as well as how they are treated, or releasing them. That's for the ones we capture. Of course, there is the alternative, the humane alternative in some people's view, I suppose, of drone attacks, in which case we get no intelligence whatsoever. Well, in a target-rich political environment like the one um, we live in, and the one I've been sketching out, it's pretty easy, I guess, to stand up here and skip rocks off several of these targets. But how does one really focus the discussion? I suggest that we start by identifying Islamism as our adversary and then try to understand it. And by understand it, I mean not only its manifestation as terrorism, but its entire anti-Western and anti-democratic agenda. Understanding basics like that will allow us at least not to empower our adversaries. I'm not suggesting that we can bring about some fundamental change within Islam. That kind of change, in fact, will have to come from reformist elements within Islam, and they exist. I recognize also that if the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment to our Constitution means anything, it means that our government cannot go around picking winners and losers in theological debates. We can certainly defend ourselves, and when fundraising for Muslim charity, a religious duty called zakat, becomes fundraising for organizations that support terrorism, that behavior should be prosecuted under statutes that criminalize material support for terrorism rather than encouraged in the guise of facilitating charity. We should not have prosecutors being told, as they are, not to bring such cases for fear of giving offense to people who are bent on our destruction. We should realize that cultivating them only endangers us but it not only endangers us, but it also silences people in the Muslim community with moderate views, and there are many such people. When our government does outreach to the Muslim community, and it does it constantly, there is no reason why that outreach cannot go to reformers, and why we cannot avoid going to organizations that are affiliated, whether directly or indirectly, with the Muslim Brotherhood, the organization founded by Hassan al-Banna in Egypt in the 1920s, whose representatives were invited to attend President Obama's speech at Al-Azhar University in 2009, and an organization that continues to this day to function actively in Egypt and through affiliates in this country, including such organizations as ISNA, the Islamic Society of North America, which was proved during the terrorist funding trial of the Holy Land Foundation, to be affiliated with the Muslim Brotherhood and to be involved in funding Hamas. There are other similar organizations who have been the objects of outreach by our government. We should recall that the motto of the Muslim Brotherhood, which one director of national intelligence testified was a largely secular organization, um, that motto is Allah is our objective, the Prophet is our leader, the Quran is our law, jihad is our way, and dying in the way of jihad, our highest hope. Doesn't sound like a secular organization. We can ask Congress to face the fact that we have to detain people and to pass a statute that defines who is subject to detention and with what safeguards and make intelligence gathering a principle and not a secondary goal following capture. I don't know whether it will come as a surprise to you that the only authority the government relies on now to detain people is the authorization for the use of military force, the AOMF, passed by Congress in September of 2001. And that statute doesn't even mention the word detention. And it may well be 
that if detainees must be charged with war crimes on an ongoing basis, and we don't have a large number of them in custody now, but that could change. In that event, we may have to ask ourselves whether the military, which is in the business of winning wars, principally by killing people and blowing stuff up, which they do very well, not running a parallel justice system, should be asked to shoulder a burden that it really may not be suited to carry. I say that most respectfully to the military, knowing that we have had military commissions before in our history, many times, but only on an episodic basis, never long term. It may well be that what is needed is a national security court to replace military tribunals, presided over by Article III judges, but staffed perhaps by the military. Many people have written extensively about what such a court might look like, including Andy McCarthy, who is seated down here to my right. Some of these steps need to be taken immediately. Recognizing the danger and prosecuting material support cases instead of worrying about the sensibilities of people who mean to destroy us are at the top of that list. Serious efforts at intelligence gathering from all terrorism detainees is a close second. I think it would be helpful at least to start the discussion about a viable detention statute. We're holding people in custody now at Guantanamo who are not charged with war crimes and will not be so charged, but are deemed too dangerous to release and cannot be released to any jurisdiction where they will be safe. There are about 100 such people, and the Supreme Court in the Boumedin case said that they had to be able to file habeas corpus cases, but left it to individual judges to devise the rules for conducting such cases. Those cases are being filed in the District of Columbia, where the judges, being human, are coming up with different standards and different results in factually similar cases. It may be that all of this will sort itself out of the usual mess of appeals and remands and so forth, but if the numbers of prisoners for some reason goes up sharply, or if there's pressure for uniformity because divergent results that were only a mild irritant until now come to be regarded as intolerable, then at least such a discussion will have generated proposals and will have something at hand. A national security court is even further on the horizon, and so perhaps we don't have to start actively talking about that yet. Procrastination is generally regarded as a bad thing, but when it comes to answering the questions that we've refused to face in the last 10 years, I think a little bit of triage is in order. We can't take on all the questions at once, and triage means dealing with what you have to deal with first, first. And so far as the ultimate question is concerned, what will winning look like? I would prefer to worry about that when the time comes to worry about it. Winston Churchill famously said in November of 1942, after the British victory at El Alamein, now this is not the end, it is not even the beginning of the end, but it is perhaps the end of the beginning. So long as the issues that I mention remain open, I don't think that we can treat even the death of Osama bin Laden, as welcome as that is, as even the end of the beginning. I think we can do that when there are more Islamists who are concerned that their movement is giving up the goal of imposing their will on the West than there are Islamists who dream of achieving that goal, and I don't think we're quite there yet. Thank you very much for your attention. Yes. Yes, sir. Hello. Okay. You know, without being ethnocentric for a moment. I'm sorry? Without being ethnocentric, maybe because we have similar background. My parents are Holocaust survivors. And they speak often, at least my mother who's still alive, of the Zionist visionary Zev Jabotinsky, who went throughout Europe in 1938 and came to the United States at the end of 1938, heartbroken after he had begged the Jews of Europe, the storm is coming, it's in Mein Kampf, he says exactly what he will do, you will all die, leave Europe, leave, leave. They didn't want to leave their, their towns, their villages, their synagogues. Here we have a prescription from the Islamists. The problem is, there are two things. One, it's a failure of imagination. We as Americans, being good people, we can't imagine the evil that they had prescribed for us in 2001 and at other times. My question very simply is, when you explain the threat and identify the enemy the way you do, you do it with great eloquence, with annotation, 
with specifics, with historical perspective. If any one of us, like Congressman Alan West, for instance, goes and starts to talk publicly at a congressional hearing about the Hadith and the Surah and all these things, they say, this guy's a fringe nut. And it is the failure of imagination of the American public to understand what an enemy is capable of. So I take it a step further in terms of what you did. How do we capture the ability of the American people to raise their level of imagination so that those who, are all, who have been on the panel all day, who are doing a great job practically, but the direction above them, the political leaders, mayors, governors, and presidents, tell them, stay out of that area. Just do what's practical and what we want you to do. Get your numbers down and don't get into those questions. Well, um, I think we continue to speak about it, for one. Um, for another, we, it occurs to me, um, show images of what actually happened. On, I mean, th there was one, there was a, a writer for, forgive the expression, the New York Times, um, <laughs> who said that, that our failure to anticipate 9-11 was uh, a failure of imagination. Um, we could show and reshow the videos um, of those planes hitting the towers. I think that would capture people's imagination, uh, as it did at the time. You'll notice you haven't seen those images um, in the last 10 years, and I would be willing to bet you the same quarter that Mayor Bloomberg was willing to put on the proposition about the bomb in Times Square, that you're not going to see them this year either. Um, the short of it is you have to keep talking about it um, and sketching it out. Um, that's the only answer. Yes. Oh, Steve Hockman, uh, covering lawyer mediator. I have a question about, it relates to the cost-benefit analysis of A, uh, torture, and B, racial profiling. I mean, Alan Dershowitz even said, if you had a, uh, a person who knew that tomorrow where the bomb was going to go off, torture is justified. Leaving aside whether waterboarding is or is not torture, what is your reaction to uh, Vice, uh, former Vice President Cheney's book where he basically said he defended vehemently his use of waterboarding because it basically got information that we saved lives, et cetera. And the whole issue of uh, racial profiling on the theory that you can't search everybody and, and whether you should, um, it, whether it's appropriate under these circumstances on the cost benefit analysis between the ACLU ver uh, position uh, versus the practicality of saving us from terrorists. Well, take the first question first. Um, I said during the speech, and I meant it, that the interrogation methods, methods that we used did not violate the torture statute. Um, the torture statute defines torture as acting under color of law so as to inflict severe physical or mental pain or suffering. Severe mental pain or suffering is defined in durational terms. Severe physical suffering isn't. Um, waterboarding, which is the most extreme of those techniques, does not inflict severe physical pain, and it inflicts no lasting mental pain. What it does is to raise the CO2 level in the blood and create a sense of panic. Um, it is used in has been used, I don't know whether it's still used, but it has been used in SEER training for Navy SEALs and other special operations personnel. Um, it has to be used very carefully because it's a very demoralizing practice. Inevitably, they give up. Um, that's what it does. Vice President Cheney did not authorize torture. There were several techniques that were considered and turned down because it was felt that they came too close to violating legal standards. So legal standards were adhered to. It wasn't that this was a lawless operation. If anything, if you read those memos, um, that operation and a great deal else about this war have been lawyered down to a mosquito's eyelash. We have not only the analysis in the memos, we have lawyers helping people at the Pentagon pick targets. Um, can you imagine Curtis LeMay 
having a lawyer at his elbow selecting targets during World War II? I can't. Um, the second question involved profiling. Um, in order to, and the, 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 the shorthand for that is often let's do it the way the Israelis do it, focus on the people you think you should focus on based on their responses to questions and other apparent uh, indicia of, of, uh, of suspicion. Um, problem with that is that the folks we have doing this um, are not sufficiently well, I mean, the, you've been to an airport. Um, you think that those people could intelligently um, focus that kind of activity? I don't. Um, and so we, we have the, the charade that we have at the airport. Yes. I don't know if you, <clears throat> excuse me, I don't know if you heard my earlier questions, but I believe that you've escorted the elephant out of the room. That is. I'm sorry? <laughs> earlier I said uh, there's an elephant in the room, and I was referring to not naming the enemy, and you've done that, so thank you. Uh, uh, radical uh, uh, Islam. Can you relate? Uh, I mean, I see that you see clearly what the problem is and philosophically where they're coming from and so forth. How well is what you think received by others in the administration or in the law enforcement agencies? In other words, uh, are they there with you or is it are there a lapse in uh, uh, difference of opinion? Um, I haven't, I mean, in the current administration? I think it varies. Um, I think New York City has an admirable program um, headed by an admirable police commissioner. And uh, one of the things I'm thankful, thankful for when I wake up in the morning, in addition to the fact that I do wake up in the morning, um, <laughs> is that Ray Kelly is the police commissioner of the city of New York. Um, I think there are a lot of people in, in the agencies that are onto it. Paradoxically, I think many people uh, in, of all places, the CIA aren't, um, uh, notably on the, on the, on the um, not on the operations side, on the, the other side, the intelligence side. Um, yes? Michael Myers, New York Civil Rights Coalition. Mr. Attorney General Judge, what are the constitutional what is the constitutional framework and the constitutional limits on preventive detention subject only to a habeas corpus? And what are the constitutional limits on, with respect to civilian trials versus military trials of sus suspected terrorists who are U.S. citizens? And what, with respect in terms of constitutional limits, are there on police agencies and the FBI who use undercover methods activities to infiltrate and to spy on and surveil uh, certain communities such as mosques, etc. cetera? Um, that's a three-part question. Um, what are the limits on, the constitutional limits um, on, you said, preventive detention? Um, the fact is that we do detain people um, in other settings. Um, we detain um, pregnant women who are a danger to their unborn children when they have drug and alcohol problems. Um, we detain some sex offenders at the end of their sentences, after their sentences have concluded, if they present a likelihood of recidivism. Um, it's a difficult issue, um, but we're going to have to face it. And I suggest facing it by trying to do something rather than saying, well, we don't know where the, barrier, where the boundaries are, so we're not going to even try to define them. Um, so far as the second part of the question had to do with, it's the short-term memory that goes first. The second part of the question is the constitutional limits and the framework for deciding between uh, trying uh, suspected, suspected terrorists in civilian versus military tribunals, and the, and the third part is the question of the constitutional limitations on police and FBI okay. agencies um, surveilling 
otherwise American communities, such as mosques? Um, I don't know that there are constitutional limits um, on trying people accused of terrorist acts. Um, in 1943, um, Germans landed off Long Island and off Florida, um, bent on uh, committing um, sabotage in this country. Um, one of them, in fact, claimed that he was a U.S. citizen. Um, they uh, were put on direct orders of President Roosevelt before a military commission um, and executed. The Supreme Court opinion upholding that, um, in fact, was issued after they were dead. Um, it took three months. Things were, worked a lot more efficiently in those days. Um, I'm not suggesting for a moment um, that we do that now. Um, what I'm saying is that there aren't constitutional limits when you're talking about that kind of activity. Um, so far as constitutional limits on surveillance, undercover surveillance, um, I signed off on the FBI guidelines um, for intelligence gathering, and um, one of the principal bedrocks of those surveillance guidelines was that First Amendment activity in and of itself could not be used as a basis and is not used as a basis for surveillance. You have to get a lot of permissions way up the line in order to conduct surveillance. That said, um, all these guidelines do is empower the Bureau along with other agencies to do things like search the net, um, develop informants, um, and otherwise keep a watchful eye. The, the, the notion that, that um, the Constitution imposes limits on somebody looking at what you do because it makes you nervous for them to look at what you do, um, I don't think the Constitution does that. Yes? Is there a, in a world of um, kind of sound bites and bumper sticker ex explanations for complex things, is there a simple way to define the line between Islam and Islamism in that people tend to lump them together? People shouldn't, um, and I'm not a theologian. Um, there are passages to which both sides appeal. Um, it's claimed that the later passages are the more authoritative, and the later passages, frankly, are the rougher ones. Um, all of that said, um, I would leave that to Muslims to sort out. I know that. Islamism involves an aggressive desire to impose Sharia as broadly as possible, um, initially within the Muslim world and then outside it. Um, and it manifests itself in all kinds of ways, um, including the establishment of self-governing enclaves within Western countries uh, that essentially are immune to the laws of the countries. Um, uh, in, which the, in which the people in those enclaves live. That kind of, that kind of uh, condition uh, shouldn't be tolerated here, can't be tolerated here, if we're going to remain uh, a cohesive society. Yes? Thank you. You've you spoken very clearly and well, and I want to thank you for what you said about the dangers to our society from a group that basically wants to overthrow and destroy it, is willing to and has killed people in attempting to achieve this objective, and is very much alive today in different places around the world. And obviously, you've illustrated a clear and present danger to the United States, a clear and present the United States and our society. And we're sitting here in this nice hotel having lunch is there anything that you would suggest we can do about it to, to make the, 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 the return of the prophet uh, less likely to occur in our lifetimes? Well, um, in a sense, the problem is a little bit worse than you described it because it's not simply a question of violence. Um, these folks will do it peacefully if they can. Um, they're not committed to violence simply for the hell of it. Um, they're committed to violence as, uh, as a means. Um, the short answer to the second part of your question is to discuss and make other people aware and educate people. Um, 
that's the way we do it in this, in this country. It's the only way we can do it. Um, can't pass laws against preaching it um, because the First Amendment says we can't. Yes? You, you were asked a question about constitutional limits um, as they pertain to different aspects of the war on terror post 9 11. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to what I think is more relevant, um, either the role of universal jurisdiction or the I'm so sorry? Uh, universal jurisdiction or the so-called internationalization of law and how that's played a role here. Um, universal jurisdiction um, is, um, is a figment of a law professor's imagination uh, that came to life in Spain principally. Um, and uh, threatens to come to life elsewhere. It is the notion that um, a court in one place uh, has the right to judge activities that go on in other countries. There is a very small core of universal jurisdiction um, that is sensible and that we have exercised. It's universal jurisdiction in cases, for example, involving piracy, um, which is a threat to the entire world. Um, it takes place on the high seas, and therefore any country uh, can prosecute it. The reason for that is that it's a threat to the international order, and it's obvious, it's obvious why. Um, slavery is, I think, a part of that as well, has become a part of that. But those are the only two activities uh, that I'm aware of that are legitimate subjects of universal jurisdiction. Um, we have now made things like um, destroying the rainforests in South America subjects of, juris of lawsuits in the United States because um, there are judges who believe in, in interesting question jurisdiction, which as far as I know isn't, isn't, pro, isn't provided for in the Constitution. I'm sorry, I can't. Um, is it, I don't know if this is on. Oh. Um, several months ago, Governor Christie appointed a gentleman of Muslim background um, as I believe a state of uh, uh, appellate level judge. Um, I don't know if you know this of this appointee's background, but if you do, could we get your take on whether or not he made the right decision? I don't know. I mean, I really, uh, commenting on, on other people's suitability who I don't know and haven't met um, isn't, I mean, I, it's something I don't think I ought to do. Uh, but when Governor Christie, I mean, the, the people pointed to specific things in this person's background, cases in which he had appeared, uh, acts he had taken in office um, as a basis for questioning whether he was suitable. When Governor Christie responded by characterizing anybody who raised those questions as a nut, um, I think he was taking one of the more attractive features of his personality a little bit too far. Uh, I want to thank Judge McKaysey. I think it is clear how fortunate we are to believe in the power of ideas. To apply the common sense and the fresh thinking to the Manhattan Institute.